So th thank you so much for the introduction and for having me at ODC again. Um, I'm really excited to be uh, virtually back. Obviously, it's it's always you know disappointing that we can't have the you know same exact level of in-person interaction. But I'm really excited to you know get to give this talk and and hopefully get some questions uh, via the QA um, uh, function uh, as well as uh, you know hopefully connect with some of you afterwards. So. Um, and again, you know, thank you so much for the, the great introduction. So I'm Alex, I'm uh, an assistant professor at the University of Washington. I'm also one of the co-founders uh, of a startup called Snorkel AI, which is based on work I did uh, um, at Stanford along with a bunch of great other people there um, while a grad student on a, you know, a system called Snorkel that I'll tell you about today along with kind of the higher level themes of interest there. Um, for those of you that had been to um, uh, my last talk at ODSC, you'll, you'll notice a lot of uh, similar themes and overlaps. I'm also going to kind of throw in some of the you know, newer results and uh, some other thoughts uh, with an emphasis on kind of you know, deployment and, and work in the real world in the field inspired by some of the work that we're doing at the company Snorkel AI. But um, obviously, there will be overlap. So just to give you the heads up on that. Uh, and I'm going to give this talk, uh, assuming no background on on snorkel or any of the other areas that I'll cover, like programmatic or weak supervision. So jumping right in, I'm going to start by spending a little bit more time than most people usually do in terms of motivation uh, uh, for you know why training data is is such a or and, and data management for machine learning in general is such a is such a you know tough and and common blocker. So one of the perspectives on what we've seen in the machine learning field over the last you know, five plus years is that uh, you know, the, the landscape has shifted in a massive tectonic way in terms of what types of models people use. And with that has shifted you know, the, the common bottlenecks or pain points in terms of actually deploying ML systems in the real world. So you know, there are kind of three major ingredients to a supervised machine learning system, which obviously, you know, I'm sure if you're, you know, uh, milling around the virtual halls of this conference, you know, you're hearing things about reinforcement learning and unsupervised learning, and, you know, well, the list goes on with lots of, you know, in-between variants. But, you know, the basic workhorse algorithm, uh, or the way basic workhorse, uh, you know, type of machine learning is, is is supervised machine learning. In other words, you know, I show you a data point with a label, uh, you being the algorithm, and your job is to learn to see a new data point without a label and predict the label for it. So this is still, you know, the majority of, you know, real world uh, machine learning deployments uh, you know, are based around this, this core paradigm of supervised learning. And there are three main ingredients here. The first is uh, training data. And uh, this is data that's, that's you know, labeled by, you know, usually or traditionally by hand with the correct label that you want the machine learning model to learn. A model that actually learns from or fits to that data. And uh, some actual hardware, I should rather just say, you know, infrastructure more broadly. And so just to give a quick running example, imagine um, you're doing like we did in collaboration with the Stanford Hospital uh, and uh, VA healthcare systems and a bunch of other great researchers trying to help radiologists by predicting whether a chest X-ray is, you know, needs to be urgently read or not. Um, your training data is, a, in, in, in that case, was hundreds of thousands of chest X-rays pre-annotated with the label um, emergency or not emergency. The model is going to look at that, you know, all that training data and basically fit its parameters, tune all the knobs that there are to tune uh, based on maximizing the likelihood of the, the training data. Uh, and then, uh, you know, that gets served in production. And so one of the biggest, uh, you know, things is that the, the uh, and I'm using kind of, uh, you know, intentionally uh, aggressive phrasing here and saying, you know, commoditization, but you know, the model and, and the hardware and the infrastructure for machine learning more broadly, you know, this used to be where you'd spend your time. If you went to a random company that was using machine learning, you said, where are all your engineers working? You, they'd say on the model, the features, the algorithm design, the architecture design, the software, the hardware to serve it, et cetera. Now, it's never been more standardized or more accessible to just pull down a state-of-the-art model from a model zoo online, write a couple lines of Python, um, you know, run it up on, you know, train it up on a, a commodity, you know, hardware and infrastructure stack and then serve it in production. Now, obviously, there are tons and tons of challenges here, but the bar to actually get something started and not just something, but, you know, a fairly advanced and capable solution for a, a whole range of challenging problems has never been lower. Conversely, uh, you know, the training data has never been a bigger pain point. 
And in some ways, this is just a, a you know simple application of the no free lunch principle. Uh, we got more powerful, more automated models. Um, there's some trade-offs. They're more data hungry. Um, a little, you know, one layer deeper. In general, the the deep or representation learning models today, you know, learn features on their own. They learn quite robust ones. They work quite powerfully. Uh, this solves a lot of the challenges that people get stuck on in practice before. But you know, the trade-off for having, you know, a hundred million parameters in kit instead of a hundred or a thousand is that you you need um, commensurately more labeled data to tune and and pick all those parameters efficiently. So just to give a quick example of what this looks like in the real world uh, that I was just talking about, um, you know, picking out models for our radiology collaborators and actually training them uh, took about actually a day or two. We tried out a bunch of the state-of-the-art models that were out there. These were all done with you know great open source frameworks. I think it was PyTorch for this one, but it might have been TensorFlow. It could have been MXNet, a million, you know, a myriad of other ones. Um, and they did this rather quickly. And another thing that was interesting to note is that amongst all the different fancy model architectures, I think at the time it was, you know, a ResNet, a DenseNet, um, a standard ConNet, a, you know, a couple of variants like that, there was less than a point difference in performance on the metric we were optimizing. I think it was ROC, AUC. Um, and, and so basically what this says is that, you know, not only was it very strikingly easy to get a, a really staggeringly performant image classifier up and running, which fancy variant of the image classifier didn't have the, the, the largest effect. But the amount of training data um, had a huge effect, uh, over 10x as much of an effect if you compare it a little bit versus the full training set. And building that full training set took eight person months of labor. So you can kind of see this is a very common occurrence where you know, the model, while still tricky and, and challenging and interesting, is not the key bottleneck, it's the data and, and labeling and managing it that is. Um, and so today, you know, access to a lot of the great and really exciting machine learning progress that we see around us is actually just blocked by this, this cost, both time, uh, monetary, and, and, and other uh, factors I'll get into of labeling training data. So just to double click on this, uh, because you know, uh, it's not just uh, kind of a marginal monetary cost like uh, many think it is. There's, there's a lot of other kind of more zero to one blockers and, and pain points in terms of, you know, not just labeling, but more broadly managing training data. The first is data privacy. So a lot of um, uh, you know, types of data that we'd want to apply machine learning to have very strict requirements that, it, uh, you know, of, of where they can go and, and who can look at them to label them. Pardon me. So if you're labeling stop signs or pedestrians, uh, you can often you know, ship this data out of org to be labeled somewhere else efficiently if you're labeling cats versus dogs. But it's a whole other world if you're labeling you know, bank records or medical images or network traffic data or insurance claims or you know, the list goes on. Often, and, and kind of this is, uh, applies to the, the group that I, or the list of examples I just, I just uh, um, gave, uh, subject matter expertise is also required often for labeling this training data. So it's uh, you know practically very difficult and expensive to label training data in many use cases because it has to often stay on-prem and be labeled by a specially trained expert, a doctor, a lawyer, a network traffic engineer, et cetera, um, and in very you know Oregon problem specific ways. And finally, you know anytime you have change in the broader machine learning system, upstream processes change, the input distribution of the data changes, the downstream pr uh, processes or systems or models change, the downstream uh, schema, in other words, what labels you want the model to predict changes uh, or, or the business objectives, let's say. Any change in the system often requires a complete relabeling of the training data. And so, um, you know, labeling huge amounts of training data by hand is not just, you know, expensive or annoying, it's, it's you know, often a downright blocker to actually making practical progress and using all the great advancements in machine learning. And, and I'll phrase this in one other way that I think is, is uh, um, interesting to think about because it kind of underscores the current design paradigm at a high level that we've settled on with modern machine learning models, which is that basically the only way to inject information that uh, a subject matter expert knows into a machine learning model is just by labeling data. With prior, you know, more uh, interpretable and modifiable classes of models, um, you know, before the deep learning age, you know, you could maybe uh, directly inject some of this domain knowledge as you know features with priors, 
uh, or, or other things like that. Now it's pretty much, you know, the only way to get, you know, a doctor say to teach this, this uh, chest x-ray classifier is just to ask the doctor to sit down and label data points one by one. And if you think about it, it's kind of like asking them to play a game of 20 or rather 20,000 questions. And often they could just tell some of the answer, at least in a, in a partial or incomplete way, directly to the algorithm, right? A doctor could explain that they're looking for certain types of image features or certain types of um, metadata in the, in the report along with the image. Um, uh, a contract analyst at a bank could explain they're looking for certain key phrases or terms to classify and route a contract a certain way, right? So um, one kind of motivating question for um, what I'm about to talk about is why can't we just have the experts who have all this rich domain knowledge just kind of give part of the answer to the model. Why can they only communicate to the model via these, you know, 20,000 questions? And for those more kind of theory-minded folks in the audience, if you want a, a little toy example, you know, imagine that uh, I was trying to communicate to one of you a, a certain word on this on this slide as an important feature for making some decision function. Think about how many you know, or, uh, how many slides I'd have to label uh, before you could understand what word I was actually looking at with no other information. And even for an, a human with perfect, you know, you know, who's almost like an Oracle model, it would take a lot of data points, a lot of labeled data points before you could guess what feature I was actually looking at. So again, the high level motivation is why can't we just directly inject this into the machine learning model? And so this is exactly what um, we've been working on uh, first at Stanford starting in late 2015 uh, through the Snorkel project. Now uh, it's uh, still in the open source and it's also a company that we spun out in 2019. It's building a, a, an end-to-end -end platform version on top of it with a much more ambitious vision that I'll talk a little bit about. But the high level idea is uh, that we've been, you know, in some sense investigating for years is, you know, why can't we change the input paradigm a little bit? So it's a little bit more direct so that a user, especially a subject matter expert can just directly express in functional form you know, what they're looking for. You know, I'm looking for these keywords, these key phrases, this bright blob in a chest x-ray, et cetera, and use this to label and thereby kind of teach the machine learning model. And so to be very clear, the goal and the vision here is not to turn, you know, sort of automagically snap our fingers and and, and make the uh, the training data labeling problem go away. It, 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 it can't go away. This, there has to be some way to impart the information about your problem that you have into the machine learning model. But rather, our goal is to make it look much more like a kind of, you know, sane, iterative uh, software development process, rather than this, you know, label for eight person months and then, then you know, hope and pray that it works. And so, as I mentioned, this is a project uh, or is, you know, a project uh, was at Stanford, uh, and, uh, uh, results in over 30 peer reviewed publications across lots of different variants. And I'll, I'll touch on some of those aspects, but there's a lot more depth that I won't get to cover. And if you're interested, you can go and uh, check it out at snorkel.org or the company now is snorkel.ai also has a list of, of papers and other resources. So all this has led into, um, you know, a kind of expansive new vision of how you go about building machine learning models by focusing on effectively programming the data. And this goes back to, you know, the very first paper that we wrote on the subject at the Stanford called data programming and now extends to a system we call SnorkelFlow, which is an end-to-end -end development platform built around this idea, uh, but extending it in, in quite major ways that the company at SnorkelAI is building. And, and again, if you're interested, the, the uh, website is, uh, as you can guess, up there. Um, but I'm not gonna really talk about this today. I'm just gonna use it as an example of a type of system that you can build when you shift away or rather abstract above just hand labeling data. Uh, to briefly describe it in SnorkelFlow, um, rather than, or in addition to labeling data by hand as your starting point or your kind of foundation for any ML effort, you start um, in a, either a GUI or in a code interface by uh, programmatically labeling and, and doing other operations to train data. This is then automatically modeled and integrated. I'll talk about this and it's what we do a lot of academic research on in a second. Automatically cleaned and modeled, managed, uh, you know, when your training data is in the form of code, rather than um, hand labels, you know, you can do all the things you can do with code normally. You can version, you can audit, you can repurpose, you can share, et cetera. And so all these features are taken care of in SnorkelFlow. Um, it's then used to train, a, uh, you know, quickly train models, whether in platform in a push button way or out of platform via Python SDK. And then finally, you know, close the loop by showing where the model is making mistakes. And this is kind of the key part, both in SnorkelFlow, but just in the high level idea as well, is that if you're 
labeling data by hand, you know, there's no real kind of way to iterate on that. You can basically just relabel stuff. Um, and you know, usually figuring out where you need to relabel is just as hard or harder of a problem. So you really just often need to kind of start from scratch. Whereas in Snorkelflow, just like any other software development process, you can just debug and iterate. You can look where the model's making mistakes, go back and edit or write labeling functions and just iterate that way until you've either improved or adapted your model uh, to a certain benchmark performance level. Um, but anyway, I'm gonna now widen the aperture and just kind of go back into the academic uh, uh, realm of you know, thinking about this, this high level concept and talking a little bit about um, as we published in the in the uh, literature, how it how it can work and what are interesting you know opportunities and challenges. Um, and again, as I go through, you know, I usually like to make this uh, you know to encourage people to interrupt with questions. I, I'm not sure if if uh, attendees can actually um, uh, uh, speak up in the session, but I know there is a kind of QA uh, function through this go to meet uh, go to webinar app. So. Uh, if you do have questions or comments, please don't hesitate to interrupt and I'll also leave time at the end, ideally. Pardon me. Um, so the um, uh, this is now zooming out um, and, and just talking about this, this high level concept. And again, the key idea is to enable users to build and manage training data programmatically. And I'll get, I'll actually explain a little bit towards the end and give a little bit of color and some pointers to why we say build and manage, not just label, because it really is, you know, a broader set of activities that we've researched and that one might want to do and commonly does uh, to training data to get it ready uh, for machine learning models. But I'll start with labeling. And um, again, I'll, I'll, I'll use snorkel flow as an example system, but I'm really just talking about the concepts that we've, you know, published about over the last couple of years and, and that you can experiment with yourselves. So in, in this setting, you know, uh, the first uh, piece is kind of the, 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 the paradigm shift or the departure from the standard way where you'd hand label a, a bunch of data. Um, here I'm kind of switching to a, uh, just to keep things interesting, to an example of trying to classify a, a loan document. Um, uh, this is just a, you know, example, a generic task, uh, but it actually is being used by, by customers, you know, top U.S. banks on top of Snorkelflow currently through the company, but also represents lots of document classification problems that, um, you know, uh, we've done uh, with, you know, uh, scientific efforts and out in the open source and, and beyond. It's just a, you know, simple canonical problem of document classification. But here, going back to that specific example, the idea in this little uh, schematic is that, you know, rather than just labeling, you know, this contract is type one, this contract is type three, um, the user can express bits of domain knowledge. Uh, some are heuristic, pattern matching based, like look for the word credit in the title, then label it a credit agreement. Um, some might uh, reference external ontologies or lists of terms, is often referred to as a distance supervision technique in the NLP literature, um, might actually apply a legacy system, either a machine learning model or a heuristic based uh, approach. Um, and again, it represents uh, how a labeling function can be something uh, that pulls in external uh, resources. Anyway, we refer to all of these as what we call labeling functions, and you can imagine it expressed with pretty simple semantics just a function that takes in a data point and either outputs a label based on some, some heuristic or signal uh, or abstains. And so the benefit of this, you know, hopefully, you know, compared to hand labeled data seems pretty obvious. You know, code can be written very rapidly. Uh, it can be applied at scale. So how, however much unlabeled data you have, you can label it all uh, with just, you know, the time it takes to run compute um, uh, just by writing, you know, a couple dozen labeling functions. Um, you can audit this, you can inspect it, you can modify it very easily. Um, you know, you can share it, you can reuse it across applications. All of these are benefits that are pretty major in practice above just using, you know, such a huge sets of hand labeled training data. But of course, there's a problem too, right? That should also kind of be obvious, which is that these are, you know, what we would call noisy or weak supervision. Um, this labeling function, pretty much anyone that you could think of writing usually, is, if you're trying to to use machine learning, it's because it's not easy to write a label, you know, a function to, 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 you know, solve the problem. And so these labeling functions in general are going to be you know, incomplete and in that they might cover only a tiny bit of the data. Um, they'll be, you know, of arbitrary and unknown accuracy. They may disagree with each other. They might be correlated in, in, in weird ways. And so you don't want to double count them if they're multiple. And, and this is kind of a core challenge. And this is one that we studied for uh, years and are still studying on the academic side of, of how theoretically and practically you can 
take in these different labeling functions, estimate their accuracies, their correlations, and, and properly reweight and combine their outputs. And so uh, this is something that we've done uh, to give a quick intuition of one of the methods, uh, actually a little bit, uh, um, you know, one of the methods that we've used over the years is uh, based on a simple intuition of looking at the agreements and disagreements between these labeling functions. So without going into full depth, this is an old intuition, you know, uh, goes back to, you know, work in crowdsourcing and way before that, um, that we approach in a new way with, with, with new twists, of course. Um, basic idea is um, to materialize this more concretely, you can look at a form of the covariance matrix and um, in a provably consistent way actually uh, recover the, uh, the, the accuracies and the correlations of the labeling functions. Uh, to give one more quick intuitive bit, imagine that uh, all of you in the audience who I can't see, so there could be uh, uh, 10,000 or there could be zero, and, and I won't uh, uh, reveal my prior, but um, you know, let's say there are more than three of you in the audience. Theoretically, as long as you're not all colluding, or let's say there are more than three groups of you that aren't kind of trading notes, if I just asked you lots and lots of questions, even if I never knew uh, what the what the true answer to those questions were, I could look at patterns of how you're agreeing and disagreeing with each other. And I see if someone is agreeing with all of uh, the, you know, or with everyone else who answers a particular question lots and lots of times, then I would you know, potentially trust that person more. And if someone is usually disagreeing with everyone else, then I would trust that person less. And if two people are always answering suspiciously the same, I would think they're probably correlated. And so actually in a theoretically provable way, I can recover everyone's accuracies and correlations just by looking at those patterns of how they answer questions, even in absence of any ground truth answers to the questions I'm asking. So that's the intuition that, that, that drives this, this combination process. So after that step, what snorkel has done, um, or you know, other techniques you could think of to, to you know, bring raise the layer, layer of uh, the level of abstraction here, is we have these, these noisy programmatic signals from users um, that are expressed in functional form, you know, either by writing code or via GUI, like we have in the, the you know, commercial version of the platform. And all of this is now reweighted and combined to, perform, to, to output a single you know, clean and confidence weighted label per data point. And then finally, um, our goal is to use this training data to train a model. And you know, one thing you might ask at this point is, oh wait, I thought we just you know, wrote these functions that label data why don't we just use that as our final predictor rather than you know, using those labels to train a model? The answer, um, of course, is you know, all of this is an empirical question. You can you know, do whatever you want and you should be guided by actual empirical data. But um, you know, why we have built this pipeline is basically to uh, try to generalize beyond what those labeling functions can cover. So say your labeling functions cover you know, some percentage of the data, we can actually train a model with enough data that learns to do better and, and cover more of the data than your labeling functions could. So just to give one example, you know, um, uh, had a deployment at a large uh, US bank that's using Snorkel. Um, uh, they were able to cover about 85% of the data with labeling functions, uh, trained a model, and the model got 97% accuracy. I'm happy to go into that in Q&A a little bit of the intuition of, of how this generalization effect occurs, but it's uh, you know been observed and, and described um, um, both empirically and theoretically in, in, in our publications over the years. Then finally, again, this ability to iterate, which is still something that we're working on formalizing and, and putting more on Rails today, but this ability to actually go back and change and improve and modify labeling functions and therefore modify your training data and therefore modify your model is also absolutely critical to you know, how this approach works and how it's advantageous in practice. Okay, so... Um, Unless anyone interrupts, I'm just going to kind of, uh, uh, you know, proceed forward and talk about a couple of case studies. And this is actually, um, you know, pulling on some, some, you know, potentially relative to the last ODSC, some slightly newer stuff, just just to try to highlight some some interesting takeaways. This is now shifting to some of the um, kind of practical observations of how this this programmatic or it's often called weak supervision approach works in practice. And let me pause for just a second or two uh, first and see if anyone has questions. I don't know, again, if people can uh, speak up or, or at least put them in the, the uh, uh, GoToWebinar um, uh, Q&A part.
Okay, I'll proceed onward then. Um, so basically, um, uh, you know, one publication we did with uh, Google and, and several teams there is, uh, and, and sorry, my takeaway point, the animation is broken apparently, so uh, no, no exciting punchline, but um, this is also all published in the literature, so I'm just gonna kind of cruise through these. If you're interested in details, you can feel free to take a look at the paper. Um, uh, basically, you know, we found that on, on three problems we studied, we were able to, you know, replace effectively tens to hundreds of thousands of hand-labeled data points just with a couple hours of using Snorkel. Um, and uh, actually here, the interesting thing that I, is just the kind of takeaway point is that in this case, you know, it could have been practical to just um, label this data by hand, right? Certainly these, these were, you know, important applications at Google, and so they, they could afford to label a lot of data by hand. But it was the fact that actually um, the, the data distribution was changing even on a you know, day by day basis. And even for Google labeling this much data um, again and again and again by hand was just not practical. Whereas with a snorkel like approach, um, you know, it's not push button, right? You would have to go in and often modify labeling functions. But again, it was you know, a couple hours or a couple minutes of modifying code um, just like you'd update any other software in the presence of change um, in, in the underlying conditions, rather than having to relabel entire massive, massive training sets. Um, and a question from Lewis, thank you very much. Um, so about, you know, do humans come in the loop uh, at step three, I'll back up to kind of figure out if the labeling functions are bad. And you know, the, the, the practical answer is, is yes and no. Uh, <laughs> a great answer, right? Um, no, the, the yes answer um, is, sorry, let me go back to here. Um, so so the, the, or the no answer first is that, you know, theoretically, and according to our experiments, the we can estimate, as I mentioned through this, this, uh, um, you know, this and actually we've, you know, shown several other techniques since then, um, without separate ground truth data, meaning without a human coming in and independently verifying any data points or any of the labeling functions, you know, provably and empirically, we're able to recover the accuracies of the labeling functions. So in that sense, um, formally the answer is no. Now in practice, um, the key answer is yes in that, you know, writing better labeling functions still makes the system perform better. This model that we learn learns how to reweight their outputs. But you know that can that can't take you know garbage in and turn it into gold. It can just kind of adjudicate disagreements, you know, downweight bad labeling functions, upweight good ones. But still, you know, to get good performance, you need to iterate and improve your labeling functions. And so, in that sense, you do have a human in the loop who is you know checking and trying to improve their labeling functions. But again, specifically in this step to estimate the accuracies, you, you know, you don't uh, provably don't need any any um, uh, humans to to intercede. Uh, a great question and, and happy to uh, take more. So it seems like at least one person found out how to use this uh, go to webinar thing. Uh, and apologies for not being on Slack. I had some sign on issues, but again, I can take questions here. Um, uh, another um, uh, recent publication that I'd referenced in the beginning, uh, and sorry for the punchline again being ruined, is that uh, we have this interesting setting um, where um, uh, that we call the cross-modal setting, where uh, in some cases we have at training time different or more modalities or features than we have at test time. So in that chest x-ray setting I mentioned, the actual nuance of the setting was that we had both chest x-rays and doctor's reports historically and, and other metadata. We didn't have the label that we wanted to predict, normal, abnormal. So we didn't have labeled training data, but we did have both image and text data. And then at test time, meaning when we actually want to apply the model, we wouldn't have the text reports because we were trying to apply this model as a triaging system uh, to images that were just coming in the hospital so we could figure out whether to flag it for immediate review or not by, by a, a human radiologist. So what we did actually is we did this kind of cross-modal pipeline. Um, I think I have a picture of it. Yeah, so let me describe it. Um, and we got awesome results, as I mentioned. You know, we, we uh, found out that um, you know, we had, here's months of, uh, uh, here's person months of human uh, hand-labeled data, and after a few days of snorkel, we get within one ROCA UC point, uh, nearly indistinguishable curve, so pretty exciting results. Um, but a very practical way we did this. We had this multimodal data 
we had um, uh, our, our doctor collaborators write labeling functions oh, actually over the text reports here. And then we trained a model that was defined over the image features. So at test time, when new information came in just containing image data, the labeling functions were inapplicable, but pardon me, the model we trained was. And so in this sense, and actually this was also saying a technique in a very different way that we did in the Google paper and in other deployment settings, you know, training data effectively served as a medium of how, you know, to transfer something you know, some domain knowledge over modality A or feature set A to modality B or feature set B. Actually, it's just to, to this is to show the generality of this kind of, you know, simple but powerful paradigm. Um, in the Google setting, actually, we had some labeling functions that were defined over features that weren't servable, didn't meet some SLA for production usage. But we trained the final model over um, SLA compliant features. Um, so uh, another, you know, uh, takeaway from recent work that I thought was extremely cool done by my colleague Jason uh, Fries um, is, you know, he he uh, has done a ton of applications of these kinds of ideas and and, and new ones uh, around this programmatic or weak supervision paradigm. In this case, uh, recently uh, used at the Stanford Hospital for some, you know, SARS COVID um, uh, symptom profiling, and. Uh, Part of the, the you know, practical reason that he was able uh, to you know, adapt this so quickly, and again, this has been out for a while, so it's not you know, six months in, it was right when, when COVID started becoming a thing, was because um, there were a ton of libraries he'd built up for um, different ways of applying these kinds of techniques in the bio dom biomedical domain. So the advantage of, you know, the, one of the biggest practical advantages of this kind of programmatic supervision approach, whether snorkel or trying it through some other, you know, uh, a scheme that you could think up is that you're labeling data with code. So you can build up repositories of useful code and helper functions and all the things you would do normally and be really quick to spin up new machine learning uh, tasks. Another uh, interesting aspect um, that actually some new work came out from Jason and others recently is the ability to use expert knowledge, for example, in the form of ontologies to uh, automatically generate labeling functions. So a simple example uh, that we published right before, and then there's been some new work out, is you know the ability to you know label um, say disease words by relying on an ontology of medical terms. Um, and so effectively, rather than you know saying okay look, we're doing the new thing here, machine learning AI, throw out all your old you know expert codified knowledge and and start from scratch hand labeling data, we're able to bridge the two and and leverage all of this codified knowledge that's available in these ontologies and other kinds of data stores, knowledge bases, uh, gazetteers, et cetera, and use it to, to train machine learning models that can outperform them. Um, and you can even actually use multiple ontologies, multiple functions over each ontology. You can have Snorkel automatically adjudicate between disagreements amongst onto different ontologies or subtrees of ontologies. A lot of interesting fun stuff there, but the high level idea is just the ability to leverage existing domain knowledge uh, that's been codified in these forms uh, to train uh, new, you know, modern machine learning models. Okay, so that was just a whirlwind tour of a couple of, you know, both past and more recent um, case studies that I think highlight interesting practical points. Uh, and finally, I'll just, um, you know, about eight minutes left. So let me pause here first for a minute to see if there are any questions, and then I'm going to just kind of widen the aperture and go through a, a couple of other key training data operations that we and others you know, have and are currently working to, to kind of formalize and support in, in, in the same way that we did uh, you know, or have been doing it with labeling. Uh, Alex, I've uh, pasted some of the questions that we got in the Slack channel in our chat box. Uh, gotcha. Sorry, I had the uh, QA open only. I'll, I'll take a look now. Okay, awesome. Let me answer some of these questions uh, before going on, because that kind of concludes the part that's about um, the labeling specifically. And then I'll just kind of, um, you know, give a quick teaser at the end for some of the other work on other operations um, that, you know, might be of interest. And can everyone see my screen? Uh, yeah, we, we can. Can you see? Can you still see the uh, the the PowerPoint the, uh, presentation? Yes. Yes. Okay, great. Um, so, um, first question: Can you explain how the labeling functions are different from feature engineering? So, it's a, it's a great question. Um, 
a bunch of answers there. You know, in terms of of just you know basic type signature, a labeling function you could think of as a feature with a with a label attached. So, um, you know, or or you could think in in a more nuanced way of a feature with a prior attached, right? So that's kind of you know distinction number one is that you're not just labeling a feature and then leaving it to the model to um, uh, determine kind of what it, what what class it's correlated with. You're you're saying that you think a certain feature is correlated with a with a certain um, with a certain label. The second thing, of course, is this overall pipeline. If you feature engineer, um, which again, you know, you, you know, still is in in some data types the 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 you know one of the key operations to do for machine learning. Um, in other areas, you know, a lot of especially with unstructured data, text, image, etc. Um, you know, a lot of feature engineering techniques have been kind of uh, superseded by deep learning approaches or representation learning approaches. Either way, if you do your feature engineering, you still need labeled data to to fit those that the model defined over those features too. Um, and so, in the snorkel approach, you know, you're you're writing these labeling functions, and then you're training some other model. You don't need to separately label data. If you were going to feature engineer, you'd also need to then label data somehow as well. And finally, you know, the basic idea, as I went through earlier in the pipeline, is that you can write a smaller number of these labeling functions, and then train a model that you know learns its own features that can be much more subtle and comprehensive and cover much more of the data. Whereas if you're doing feature engineering, you need to make sure your features cover you know all of the data, otherwise your model has no chance of covering it. If it makes sense. So hopefully that that example helped uh, clarify a bit. It's a very interesting you know an apt question. And happy to follow up if if there if there are follow up questions. Um, next question is: Have you looked into using the labeling function for inference in a case where a given sample matches the training distribution? That's a great question. Um, there's there was a paper with Intel that we did where they explored the kind of ensembling of the what we would call the label model, which is the um, let me go back to an actual pipeline diagram so I can have a picture up while I speak. Um, so, so basically, like, if you look, um, if you can see my mouse, you know, this this step um, where you're reweighting and combining the labeling functions, we refer to that um, as the label model, and itself is a predictive model to your point, as I mentioned. Um, and you know, this n model is, is the model you finally train. And as I noted before, you know, the idea is that the n model will often, you know, uh, do better than the label model because it can boost the recall. It can cover and, and generalize if properly regularized to a lot more features. Um, the idea of ensembling the two of saying, look, like if the, the label model is really confident, then go with it. But if it's not, then go with the, the learned uh, N model is something we've explored a little bit, probably not enough. And it's, it's certainly a very interesting idea. I, I don't have, a, a, unfortunately, don't have a ton more to say there because I think we still have to look into it more. Um, Okay, I see a repeat of the question. And then one other one here I see is, um, what would a labeling function look like for image training data? So um, I don't have any slides up here, unfortunately, but there's a, a kind of two basic ways that we've tackled it, right? So one is in this cross-modal way where you know your labeling function is over a different modality, right? Even though you're training a, an image model. The more you know, direct answer to your question, though, is a way that my colleague um, and one of my co-founders now at the Snorkel Company, Paroma Varma, spent a lot of time working on, starting with a NeurIPS 17 paper, um, is the idea that you know, the, the, the challenge with images is that you don't have the same kind of what, what you know, she called in that paper primitives or building blocks you could think of that you do with something like text. So text is a... a Completely unstructured and messy, you know, extremely challenging data set, the data type, as, as many of you um, with experience with the NLP field know. But it does have these kind of primitives or building blocks, uh, like words, you know, for example, right? You don't have the same thing with images. Um, but the trick is that if you can provide them, and it's easier than ever to provide them because there's a ton of you know bounding box detectors, feature extractors, etc., just out there in the open source, then users can write labeling functions over those. So, for example, you know, I could do shape detection over the chest X-ray, and then users could write things like labeling functions like if any circular objects are greater than k centimeters and greater than this brightness, then label it abnormal. And we did that with um, some mammography problems and also a cardiac uh, video monitoring uh, with the Stanford Hospital System. There was a paper in Nature Communications about that recently. Um, you could say for activity detection, if bounding box 
around the person is above bounding box around the bike and roughly the same proportions, then the person is riding the bike for activity classification, another, another uh, uh, one that we studied. So that's just a little flavor of that. Um, okay, and then down to the last three minutes, I see, oh, there are some other uh, questions. So let me go back, but I'm just gonna, uh, let's see. So I see, I think I covered most of these. Um, I'll try to see if there's a, a minute or two afterwards, but just to kind of push on to the last slide, I'm just gonna give a quick preview of some of the other things we worked on. I'll just show one slide, um, which is mainly, you know, what are other uh, kind of the, the heuristic that we've used on the research side with this whole project is to, uh, you know, not a, not a, not a, a, a mysterious one. We go look in practice and we say, look, what, what are, well, first, what are people doing, you know, as ML systems researchers, uh, we ask, what are people doing to get machine learning deployed? And where are they getting stuck? And where are their biggest leverage points? And that was what led us to, to look at training data in the first place, because we said, look, this is where the action's at, or conversely, where people are getting stuck in the real world. Next, we said, okay, what are people doing to train data to actually get machine learning models performing? And labeling in the supervised learning setting seemed like the most obvious one. And so that was the work I just showed. Also, I've done a lot of work exploring uh, things like data augmentation. So um, the canonical example here is if you want to train an image classifier and you look at any state-of-the-art image classifier, they always, you know, randomly rotate or stretch or blur the images ahead of time. You're basically kind of communicating your invariance that you think the problem should respect by making copies of the data set. And, and, and it's a very critical uh, technique. We tried to abstract that and call these, these um, operations like rotations or flips or even swapping words for text. We refer to them as transformation functions. And then just like with labeling functions, we can automatically kind of tune how they're compiled together to improve performance there and just support it with a system. And then finally, um, more recent work, we've looked at um, a paradigm called slicing functions, which is meant to capture this idea that often what people are doing with their training data is not labeling or augmenting it, but is actually, or additionally, trying to identify certain subsets of it that are really important for the model not to mess up on and making sure the model pays attention to those subsets or slices. So with that, I think I'm over time. So why don't I pause there? Um, hopefully some of this was interesting. Uh, all, all the stuff that I talked about, um, including this last little teaser for some of the broader set of work is all you know online in, in publications and blog posts and stuff like that. And so why don't I wrap up here and, and thank you all so, so much for your